Okay, so today we continue the overview of electrostatics. I will uh, very rapidly review uh, the statistical mechanics. I mean, not review, but just uh, write a few useful uh, formulas. And then we'll start Poisson-Boltzmann theory. But before, I want to, to come back to, to yesterday, to the electrostatic uh, energy. So if you have charges, uh, QI, Ri, a certain number of charges, you have a potential energy which is one half sum over I not equal to J of uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Qi Qj divided by Ri minus Rj. And this is just, if you remember that if you define the potential phi of R as sum over I of 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 QI divided by RI minus RJ, this is just 1 half of sum over J of, or sum over I of QI phi of RI or phi I where phi i is the electrostatic potential uh, created by all charges except the charge i. So the generalization of this, as we saw, if you go to the continuum with the density of charge rho of r equals sum over i of qi delta of r minus ri, then this u is equal to one half integral d3r. So you see that if you put this here and if you put phi of r, this is just rho of r, phi of r. So the electrostatic energy of a system of charges is one half the integral of the charge density times the electrostatic potential. And now if you remember the Poisson equation, the Poisson equation tells you that Laplacian of phi equals minus rho over epsilon zero. Okay, so if I replace here rho by its expression, this is minus, so rho is minus epsilon zero Laplacian phi. So this is minus epsilon zero over two integral d3r Laplacian phi times phi. And if you integrate by part, so I, I will show you this integration by part because it happens, it comes in all the time. So the integration by part of Laplacian phi phi, uh, sorry, is, you can write it as integral d3r of gradient phi times phi minus, so if you write it like this, the first term is equal to this, and then there is an additional term which is gradient phi times gradient phi, so it's gradient phi squared, so you have to subtract it, so it's minus integral gradient phi squared. And then you have uh, the Gauss theorem. The Gauss theorem tells you that, so it's a, it's a theorem about integral, right? It's not Gauss law. Gauss law, which we saw, which is a divergence. So there's two things. There is Gauss, Gauss theorem, which is that, and, and there is Gauss law. So Gauss law is just that divergence of E equals rho over epsilon, epsilon zero, where rho is the charge density, right? That's Gauss law, that's the, one of the basic, that's one of the Maxwell equations actually, it's one of the basic law. This equation in fact is derived or it is equivalent to the Gauss theorem and the Gauss theorem or it has other names also, tells you that the integral over a certain volume 
d3r of a certain function uh, uh, divergent uh, divergence of a certain vector f is equal to the integral on the surface of f times the normal outside the surface ds. So if you have a volume v and the surface s, you define the unit vector n on the surface. And this is a theorem of uh, differential calculus. OK, so from this uh, theorem, you see that uh, this quantity is exactly of this type. And therefore, this quantity is just the, so if you have your system in a whole volume, this is just, uh, so I don't know if you can see it, but if we, I, I will write it here. So we have a, something like integral D3R over the volume where all the system is confined of gradient of uh, divergence, let's say, of phi phi. This is the integral ds on the surface outside of n phi gradient phi. And now if the system, and so this is on the external surface of the system. Now if your system is at equilibrium and if there is no external field applied to the system, then this quantity on the surface outside is zero. Therefore, this integrated term in general is zero. And if this integrated term is zero, we have this uh, nice property that this integral phi Laplacian phi is equal to plus epsilon zero. So there is only a contribution of this term and this is gradient phi square, which you know from electrostatic, which you can write as the electrostatic energy is just the integral of E square dr. This is the contribution of the electrostatic energy. It's an important result. Okay. Um, yes? This one, because if your system, if you're in a large system, the electric field on the boundary, if, if you have the, the electric electrostatic field is zero. If it was not zero, then the charges would not be at equilibrium uh, at infinity. Okay. So. Okay. And if you have if you have uh, boundaries, uh, if you have a uh, 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 solid bound, yes. But the reasoning about the boundaries is without using the Gauss theorem, right? Just because we have an integral. Yes, it's just. Of a, of a this is this is a mathematical theorem. Yes. Right. But this is this is Gauss theorem. That's a, a math theorem. That's not physics. That's uh, just uh, purely math. It's it's just the integration by part. You know, it's uh, when you do integration by part, you have a term which comes from the boundary minus. So this is exactly what I write here. Now this term is equal to that from this theorem, and this is equal to zero. Is it, is it not equal to zero because the left hand side is an integral of a gradient? So you can. Uh, yeah, but the integral, but the integral of a of a divergence, it's not necessarily zero. It depends what you have on your on your surface. Yeah. Because you said that you put the boundaries in infinity, so yes. Yeah, so if if every if the potential goes to zero, if the electric field is zero at infinity, then it is zero. But you can have situations where it's not zero. It can be, but in general, it is zero. Okay. It's it's nothing. It's not a big deal. I mean, it's uh, okay. 
Okay, last thing I want to do uh, in this review of electrostatics. Uh, okay, maybe I will do it when we... I, I was going to talk about, uh, about dielectric, uh, what happens when you have a dielectric medium. But uh, maybe I will do that... Uh, Okay, I will do it later in the in the course of the class. Okay, so so let's say we have done electrostatics in the vacuum, and at some point I will come back to electrostatics uh, for the electric media, especially when we'll study water, uh, dipolar fluids, and uh, and the surface tension in uh, electrolyte solutions. So now I come to. Uh, very rapid overview of statistical physics, and uh, I will just review what I need in the beginning uh, for the course. Okay, so So essentially, I will work, and everything we do will be in the canonical ensemble. So canonical ensemble is a is a ensemble uh, of particles which are in a thermal equilibrium with a heat bath at a certain temperature T, and uh, so you know there are several ensemble. Uh, which can describe uh, uh, the thermodynamics of systems. So there is the microcanonical where the energy is fixed, there is the canonical, etc. And in general, these ensembles are equivalent in the thermodynamic limit for large systems. And this relies very much on the fact that the interactions between the particles are short range. So here, the interaction of the particles are not short range because it's Coulomb interaction, so it decays like one over R. But we will see that for a neutral system, in fact, when the system is globally neutral, uh, effectively the interaction between particles is short range and there is a decay, exponential decay of the interaction at large distance. So this is not true. So if you think about gravity now, gravity has the same kind of interaction. It goes like one over R. But uh, the difference between gravity and uh, electrostatics is that in gravity there is no negative mass. Uh, there are only positive masses and they attract. So there is no repulsion. So there is no such thing like a screening or a charge compensation like you have in... A, and therefore, when you have a gravitational system, there is no equivalence between microcanonical ensemble, canonical ensemble, between all the thermodynamic ensemble, and you have some uh, uh, very weird uh, things which can happen depending on the ensemble where you look at. Okay, so if the Hamiltonian of the system is, if you have n charges, uh, each one has a momentum pi, position ri, so the Hamiltonian is sum over i of pi square over 2m plus a certain u of ri, where u of ri is the interaction energy of the particles. Mm. So if it's Coulomb, so I don't specify, but if it's a Coulomb energy, u would be one half of sum over i j of v Coulomb of ri minus rj. Uh, times qi, qj, or something like that, right? But it's a function of all the ri's. So then the Boltzmann weight, so the probability to find the system at equilibrium, the probability to find the system in a certain configuration r1, rn, which I write p of ri, is given by the Boltzmann weight, which is e to the minus beta h, of pi ri divided by z 
where z is the partition function. And is defined, it's a normalization, so if it's a probability, sorry, it's P of, I forgot, there is all the PIs, the RIs and PIs. It's P, the probability as function of the momenta and the, the partition function is the integral, the uh, PI over all PI over all RI of e to the minus beta h of pi ri. So that the integral of p over ri and pi is one. Thanks. And uh, as a side note, you know that, uh, so this is the Boltzmann weight. And Boltzmann has two n. And Boltzmann committed suicide not far from here in Duino, which is uh, very nearby, and you can go and there is a memorial with the formula for the entropy. <clears throat> okay, um, so in most cases, the Hamiltonian has this form, which means the kinetic energy of the particles is quadratic, it's pi squared over 2m. In that case, you see that all this is uh, very simple because the integral, so in general, the integral over the Ri is very complicated. You cannot do it. And the, the distribution of Pi is just Gaussian. It's, it's a so-called, so the distribution of Pi is essentially proportional to e to the beta Pi square over 2m. And this is just a called a Maxwell distribution. So in general, one is not really interested in the distribution of velocities because it's, uh, it's very simple. There is no surprise. It's always like this. And it's, uh, it's decoupled. It's not mixed with the position. It's independent because the, because the weight e to the minus beta h is the product of this Maxwell distribution by e to the minus beta u. So rather than this, in the following, we will be used, uh, we will be, we will mostly use the p of ri, the probability to find a certain configuration of the ri, which is the integral over pi of this uh, distribution here. Right, it's the probability to find a particle at Ri with any Pi, with any momentum. And since the distribution on Pi and Ri are independent, the distribution factorized and you can integrate, so it's integral e to the minus beta Pi square over 2m. So it's always sum over i, uh, d3 Pi times e to the minus beta u of ri divided by integral d3 pi e to the minus beta sum over i pi square over 2m times e to the minus beta u of ri. <coughs> and therefore, we come to the result that the probability to find the system in a configuration R1, so when I write like this, it means all the particles R1, Rn. This is just given by the reduced Boltzmann weight, e to the minus beta u of Ri, divided by z, where z is the reduced partition function, which is product over I d3 Ri, e to the minus beta u of Ri, where u of Ri is the potential interaction energy of the particles. Now the great uh, properties of this is that Z is related to the free energy by the standard relation Z is e to the minus beta F. So F is the free energy.
so free energy. So F equals minus KT log Z. K is the Boltzmann constant. And a beta, okay, I think I said it, uh, beta is one over KT. And um, you see that, for instance, the internal energy, which I write you, but it's a bit. So the internal energy is the expectation value of U of Ri, right? And so you see that uh, if you take, so it's related to the free energy by the following way. If you take the log of Z, and if you take a derivative of log of Z with respect to beta, so if you calculate D, D by D beta log Z, so if I take the log of Z, it's one over Z, and the derivative of this with respect to beta will be integral product over I, D3 R I, and I bring down minus U of R I, E to the minus beta U of R I. And therefore, you have this property that the expectation value of U is minus D by D beta of log Z, right? Expectation value of U is the integral of U times the Boltzmann weight divided by, by this. Is it okay? It's clear? So you have this property U So we have this property that u equals minus d by d beta log z. And since z is minus log z minus log z is beta f, so it's by d by d beta of beta f. So this is an important relation which relates the internal energy The internal energy U is related to the partition function or to the free energy by this uh, standard relation. And uh, so from this you can get also the entropy uh, by writing that U, so if you expand the derivative U is therefore F plus beta dF by d beta. And I remind you that F is u minus t s. So you see that t s equals beta d f by d beta, which means that s, if I divide by t, it's beta square d f by d beta. And this, of course, you can check by going from beta to t that this is minus df by dt. So these are a few thermodynamic relations which you can deduce from statistical mechanics and which we will use very often uh, in the next of the course. Okay, to conclude this section before starting on Poisson-Boltzmann theory, I want to go to define what's called the grand, to go to the grand canonical ensemble. So any question about this? Uh, this is, I guess, very standard. You have seen this uh, probably many times, but I prefer to have the notations uh, straight. So uh, last thing is the grand canonical ensemble. So in a canonical ensemble, uh, the energy is not fixed. The average energy is given. But what is fixed is the temperature of the bath, of the heat bath. And the energy uh, fluctuates 
there is the average energy of the system is the internal energy, which is given like this, and the fluctuation of the internal, uh, the fluctuation of the energy is related to the specific heat, which uh, we'll see later. Okay, so now you can have a system which is uh, in equilibrium. So in a canonical system, in a canonical ensemble, your system is at temperature T and it's exchanging energy with a heat bath, uh, which is a thermostat at temperature T. So it exchanges energy so that the temperature of the system is fixed at temperature T. In the grand canonical ensemble, the system is, cannot not only exchange energy with the system to be at temperature T, but it can also exchange particles. So there is an exchange of particles so that the average number of particles is fixed. Right? When it's canonical, the total number of particles is exactly fixed. You work in an ensemble with a given fixed number of particles. Here, in the grand canonical ensemble, you don't work with a fixed number of particles. The number of, so the system can be in contact with a reservoir of particles and can exchange particles with it. What is fixed is n, the average number of particles. And the equivalent of the temperature here, in that case, is mu, which is the chemical potential. Okay, so the grand partition function now, so the Boltzmann weights, everything can be defined in the similar way. The difference is that we now define a grand partition function. So this grand partition function is a function of temperature, of course, and mu uh, let's say uh, mu. Okay, let's assume there is only one species, but if you have many species of uh, particles in the system, you can have many different mu's. And this grand partition function is equal to sum n equals zero to infinity. So n is the number of particles. So the chemical potential enters as e to the beta mu n over factorial n, and then integral product over i equals 1 to n, d3 ri, e to the minus beta u of ri. So this is the partition, the canonical partition function with fixed n, like, like this one. And the difference is that you sum over all possible number of particles with a chemical potential which is here. And the chemical potential is adjusted in such a way, so in such a way, so first of all, this partition function, this grand partition function is equal to uh, the exponential of, uh, of um, the grand potential, which plays the role of the free energy, so it's e to the minus beta omega of, uh, of t and mu. So this omega is the equivalent of the free energy, which is here, but it depends on the chemical potential mu, and you adjust mu in such a way that the average number of particles is fixed, and you see that in order to get the average number of particles, if you take a derivative with respect to mu, you bring down beta n, so you have that average n is equal to d by d mu log z of t mu, and the d by d mu brings a beta, so it's one over beta. And therefore, it is minus d by d mu 
of omega. Okay. Okay, and uh, I don't know if we will use it, but omega is directly related to the pressure in the system, and omega is minus PV. In the grand canonical ensemble, omega is minus PV, where P is the pressure, V is the volume. These are standard uh, thermodynamic relations which uh, we will use in, in order to calculate, for instance, the osmotic pressure in a fluid, in a Coulomb fluid. Okay, so this is all I wanted to tell you about uh, statistical physics, thermodynamics, and uh, now we can start, uh, we can start specifically the Coulomb electrolytes and the uh, charge. Is there any question about all this? No? Is it too, yes? Is there any K missing in the entropy formula? Sorry? Uh, in the entropy formula. Yes. Uh, I think the K is missing. Yes, the there is a K missing, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take uh, K equals one. Uh, K is missing, uh, yes, because, um, yes. Definitely, K is missing. The last part, when you uh, divide T into the most size, you have to multiply and divide K. Yes. S equals K meant up to the power of 2 Bf to the... Yes. So there is a K... Yes. So here, 1 over T. So 1 over T is K beta. So there is a K here. Okay. Thank you. Yes? I always uh, forget the case. Sorry? No, beta omega is dimensionless. Beta omega is dimensionless. Omega is a free energy. It's an energy, so... Yes, so beta omega is dimensionless, so omega has a dimension of an energy. It's a free energy. It's a grand potential. It's called, it's called a grand potential. Yes. Thank you. Any other comment, mistake, question? Okay. Um, so this is it for, now I come to Poisson-Boltzmann theory. And I will do simple Poisson-Boltzmann. So this is really the simplified approach to Poisson-Boltzmann, the simplest form. And uh, you will see how one can derive in a few lines the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So the idea is the following. Assume you have uh, N1 particle of charge uh, Q1 equals Z1E. So Z1 is the valence, is the number of charges. Everything is measured in number of electronic charges. So Q1, uh, you have N2, Q2, Z2E, etc. N, uh, what did I use? Nm, okay. Nm, uh, Nm, Qm. Okay, and then we can have, so th these charges are mobile. So they can move around, they, they're floating, they're at thermal equilibrium, and you may have some solid surfaces which are charged with uh, some fixed charge density, rho f of r. So it can be walls, uh, charged walls, uh, charged object, 
and you have a solution uh, floating around. And so the charged object, the, you have fixed charges which are there, and you have these mobile charges which are there. Okay, so what you can write is that the charge density rho of r is rho f of r plus rho m of r, where rho m of r is the charge of mobile ions. Okay, so we have the Poisson equation. And I will assume that there is a, we are, all this is working in a medium with dielectric constant epsilon, constant dielectric constant epsilon. So the Poisson equation is that Laplacian phi equals minus one over epsilon rho of r. So Laplacian phi equals minus rho f over epsilon minus one over epsilon rho mobile of r. Now the second thing is if your mobile charges are at equilibrium in the bath, so what they see the external potential phi of r, so their energy is q k or uh, q k phi of r. That's their potential energy, right? If phi of r is the potential, their energy is q k of r. So the both the probability to find the species k at point r is one is given by e to the man minus beta q k phi of r divided by z k. This is the probability to find a particle of species r at, uh, of species k at point r. And therefore, you see that the Boltzmann equation is, so it's minus rho f of r divided by epsilon minus one over epsilon. And the density of mobile ion is a sum over k of the probability to find the particle k at point r. And I assume that there are nk such particles, so it's minus nk qk. This is the charge, the total charge, times the probability e to the minus beta qk phi of r divided by zk. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, so this is the probability for a particle of type K to be at point R. If I have NK such particle, the average number of particles of type K which will be at point R is NK times this. And since they each carry a charge QK, the charge density, the total charge density is given by this. Let me continue just one second. So here I didn't specify ZK is just, of course, the local, the, the partition function of this species. So it's just the normalization factor for this. So it's just integral D3R of E to the minus beta QK phi of r. Yes? Sorry? It's the partition function for, okay, so in this approximation, if you want, the total energy of the system would be sum over k of qk phi of r. Right? And therefore, you see that there is a factorization the, for, for particle, if you have a particle at point, if you have your particles at point R1, R2, Rk, 
they live in a potential which is phi of R1, phi of R2, phi of Rk. So the, the, the true, the full partition function would be integral product over K dRk e to the minus beta sum over k of qk phi of rk. But if you look for each particle, if you want, for a single particle, the probability to find a single particle of type k at a point r, it's given by this, divided by zk, because it, it factorizes each particle. They, they don't, in, I mean, in this approximation, in this Poisson-Boltzmann uh, uh, kind of framework, the particles live in an external potential phi, which is created by themselves, but it's uh, the same potential for everybody. So each particle sees the same potential phi of R. So, okay, and now the big thing which is the further simplification is that uh, if the potential goes to zero at infinity then this is integrated over a certain volume if the potential goes to zero and you take the volume to go to infinity this is essentially equal to the volume so if your particles if the system is confined in a certain volume and you take this volume to infinity and the potential goes to zero at infinity, then this zk is essentially equal to zero. And we get therefore nk over v. So the equation becomes minus rho f over epsilon minus one over epsilon sum over k of qk ck zero e to the minus beta qk phi of r. So where ck zero is the average uniform density nk over v. So it's the concentration of particles of type k if they were uniformly spread over the system. So this is a concentration the bulk concentration of your ions of type K in the system. And this is the, so this equation is the so-called Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Yes? Uh, I get that uh, the potential in the Barker condition will goes to zero, and so Zk will be goes to V. But as dimension, I don't well, understand the, A partition function has the dimension of a volume. Because, uh, because the exponential is dimensionless, a partition function has always the dimension of a volume. You, in fact, so if you want to be really there is a subtlety which I, which I avoid, but uh, okay, if you, if you are interested, uh, when you derive all this, you have a question? Okay. Yes, okay, so in fact, yes, but uh, that's okay, so. You integrate it over the volume and you get one. It's a density of probability. It's not a probability. It's a probability distribution function. So it's a density. But okay. So the question of the of the dimension of partition function. In fact, if you remember what you learned probably in the beginning of statistical physics, is that the real partition function you start in quantum mechanics, and when you do in quantum mechanics, you have to make cells in the phase space, and the partition function, in fact, is product over i, d3 pi, d3 ri, over, so I don't remember if it's h bar cube or 2 pi or h cube, and this is dimensionless. Is it h, it's h bar cube, I think. 
is it h or well the, the dimension is the same anyway and then e to the minus beta h of pi ri so of course if you write it like this and that's what comes out naturally uh, from quantum mechanics uh, the partition function is dimensionless and then uh, that's okay etc but you see that when you deal with Boltzmann weights or things like that you take always ratios and so if you take ratios this constant which is here disappears and uh, nobody bothers to write explicitly this constant uh, there the price is of course that uh, partition function has the dimension so if you have n particles it has the dimension of a volume to the n if you omit the h bar cube uh, thing but doesn't matter because it's always ratio quantities are always ratios that uh, Sorry, okay. Sorry, the like N? Gas. No, no. The N comes if you have N particles. So you integrate over... In an ideal gas, right? No, in, a, in an ideal... The, okay. So let me... Is it okay? Well, if you take... So let me do in one second the ideal gas, the ideal gas. The, so if I take the reduced partition function without... Uh, it's integral product over i d3 r i e to the minus beta times zero because there is no interaction between the particles so the the partition function of the ideal gas is just so the Boltzmann weight is is one it's uniform and therefore it's just v to the n as I was writing here and from this of course you can easily get the equation of state, the P equals uh, K, uh, RK, PV equals KT, etc. You, you can write if you. So exercise uh, derive all the laws of. Uh, ideal gas from this you can get it very easily and uh, okay that's uh, fairly trivial okay okay so this is again the poisson boltzmann equation which is a mean field kind of so mean field in the sense that you assume that all the particles are creating a potential phi and they leave all in the same potential phi which is created by, by them. So you see that it's a very highly nonlinear equation which is a kind of self-consistent equation which enters in phi. So the density, the concentration of charges is created by the potential and the potential creates itself so it's a kind of self-consistent uh, nonlinear equation so this has to be supplemented by some boundary conditions and uh, in electrostatics there are essentially two types of boundary conditions so one is a fixed potential so if you have some uh, systems some fixed charges in the system like a wall like whatever and you fix the potential phi equal phi zero you fix the potential on the surfaces so then this is called the Dirichlet boundary condition or Dirichlet condition Another frequently used, so this can be phi one, you fixed a potential here. So essentially you fixed potential on some surfaces. Uh, the other boundary condition, which is uh, very often used, and we, we will see because we will see how to solve this equation in a few simple cases. So it's a fixed charge density.
So fixed charge density is you fix on the boundary, you fix sigma. But fixing sigma, you know that as we saw, if, for instance, if it's a conductor, if you fix sigma, then close to, to the surface, the electrostatic, put, the electric field E at the surface is sigma over epsilon. And therefore, it is minus, so it's sigma times n, where n is a normal to the surface. And therefore, this is minus gradient phi n at the surface. So this is the other boundary condition that the normal gradient of phi, so the normal component of phi near the surface is fixed and determined by the surface charge density. Okay, so a few comments. So these are the two, and this is called the Neumann boundary condition. Neumann, Dirichlet. And it changes, uh, it can change a lot. What else did I want to say? So let me give you some example of the Poisson-Boltzmann uh, equation in some simple, some simple cases. So any question about uh, boundary conditions? So it's a second order equation. You have uh, boundary conditions which are everywhere and so, I give you an example because, the, of course, this can simplify a lot. So, for instance, uh, Z, Z salt. So, what is a Z, Z salt? It's a symmetric salt where you have, a con you have two types of charges, plus Z, plus Z E, and minus Z E. So you have cations, anions, anions. Z can be one in NaCl, but it can be different. And of course, uh, if the system is neutral, then you have the same concentration for both. So the Poisson-Boltzmann equation takes the form Laplacian phi equals minus rho f over epsilon. And the interesting term is this one. So this one is so you have two species. So here, of course, it's one to m when you have all the m species. Now m is equal to two. They both have the same uh, concentration. So you have a factor of c, which is this one. And one comes with a charge plus z e. So it's e to the minus beta z e phi. And the, and then the other one comes with the charge minus Z E, so it's minus Z E and with a plus here. <coughs> you see, and this is just minus two C Z cinch beta Z E phi. So the Poisson-Boltzmann equation takes the form. So there is a fine minus, so it's plus 2Cz over epsilon sinh beta Z E phi. Let me... So this is the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So you can forget the rho f because usually the rho f is just a boundary condition. Uh, so this is the form of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation for a system for a symmetric plus Z minus Z salt. C and C, what are C and C? C and C are the concentration of the plus ion and of the minus ion. So they have the same concentration because, uh, because of charge neutrality. I, I will always assume charge neutrality in the system. So, because uh, they have the same charge, of course, the concentration. Okay.
okay, so you, were, you can work out uh, more complicated non-symmetric cases, but this is an example and we'll see how one can solve it in uh, certain simple geometries or simple cases. What else did I want to say? Okay, so in general, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, yes? Of, of fixed charges, not the mobile charges. This, the row F, what, can you repeat? Uh, weak charges are, this, this density is for weak charges? I don't understand, sir. And we have two kinds of charge. Yes, there are fixed charges, with, like walls, like, uh, like uh, surfaces, which don't move. Okay, so they're, they are, they are not mobile. And then you have charges which move around, it's like if you take uh, here in the, in the room, right? You have walls, the walls don't move, and you have air particles which are floating around and which are a thermal equilibrium. So these are the fixed charges which are in the system. So you can have, a, for instance, you can have a wall, a charged wall, or you can have a sphere, a charged sphere, whatever you want. And then this is the contribution or this, if you want, is the contribution of the ions which are floating around in the solution, which are at thermal equilibrium and they are uh, moving around and uh, sampling the space, etc. In the case of the solution of salt in water, I don't have a row of the reactions. In the, if it's pure salt, you don't have this. But if you have salt, for instance, we'll see one example we'll study next time is for instance you have a wall, a charged wall, with a certain charge density, and you have here a salt around, then uh, this will be, and usually this term is a boundary condition, right? It tells you that uh, at the surface you will have a charge density or something like that. So you, you can put it or not, I mean keep in mind that there is some, uh, some surface charges that can be present so you either you write it explicitly or you or you take it into account as a boundary condition so just a few comments about the poisson boltzmann equation uh, it's a very complicated equation because it's nonlinear if you have general so for instance people use it uh, to describe the to describe the profile of ions near uh, molecules. Like uh, in biology, you, want, you have a protein, you want to see how the ions are surrounding the protein, what is the profile, the concentration of ions around the protein and things like that. So this, in this case, you cannot solve analytically the equation. So there are very few cases where this Poisson-Boltzmann equation can be solved analytically. We will see a few. So one example is, a, is the one-dimensional case when you have a wall. So I, I mean, you can write it. Uh, so one wall. So in 1D, you can do quite a few calculations. In particular, you can do uh, wall with counter ion, wall, so wall with salt, etc. In 2D, so it's a charged surface. And of course, it is used to model a biological membrane in a physiological condition where you have a, a, in presence of a physiological fluid, which is essentially a salt at the 0.1 molar concentration. In 2D, it's the cylinder, and the cylinder the cylinder, uh, so it's all, again a very simple geometry. Uh, it can be solved only for the case of counter ion. I will explain what's the difference between counter ion and salt. And, uh, and that is a model, so charged surface is membranes. This is, uh, 
polyelectrolytes. So polyelectrolytes, as I said, are polymers which are charged. DNA is extremely charged, so it's very rigid because of the Coulomb repulsion, and locally it looks like a cylinder. So you can ask what is the profile or what is the distribution of ions around the DNA in a solution, and this is a more or less given by solving the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So there is an analytic solution for that. And in 3D, no analytic solution, but there are some approximate analytic solutions. Now, if you want to go beyond, you have to go to a numerical solution. So there are many packages which are commercial, open source or so, which solve uh, numerically the Poisson-Boltzmann equation because chemists, uh, biologists really use it in order to, as we will see, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation allows you also to calculate the force between the objects to see if they bind together or not due to, so in uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, bio biologists, I mean biochemists and all kinds of people use the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, and uh, therefore there are uh, a lot of work on solving the numerically the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. The way, uh, the way you do it is the following. You start, so if I take, uh, for instance, this equation, so what you do is you start with a guess, phi z, so first you guess. You guess a phi zero. So you guess a certain profile of, uh, of uh, electrostatic potential in your system. So you discretize your system. First you discretize. So you make a lattice. With a certain uh, lattice spacing, whatever. And uh, on this lattice, first you put all the fixed charges. So for instance, you can have an object like this. So your lattice, uh, of course, there is big discussions what the lattice spacing should be. This all is discussed. And you put the charges, you spread the charged. So for instance, if this is a charged, a fixed charge object, like a, mo like a macromolecule or any molecule or whatever you have in your system, you spread the charges on the lattice points. So you have this. Two, you guess initial phi zero of R. So you guess a certain, the potential everywhere on your lattice. Then three, solve Laplacian phi equals V of phi zero. So what I mean by that is that you put phi zero here. So this is what I call V of phi zero. So you solve this equation, Laplacian of phi equals V of phi zero. Okay, so this equation, this is quite easy to do. Because if you, I mean numerically, if you give yourself the boundary conditions, either Dirichlet or Neumann or whatever, then this equation is easy to solve. You solve it, you get a new solution, which is phi one, by solving this equation. And then you use it as an initial solution and you iterate the process. And by doing that, it converges and you get finally a solution for the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, which satisfies this. Of course, it converges if your initial phi zero is not too far from the final uh, state that you're looking at. So it's a kind of fixed point method, which is completely widely used uh, to solve the Poisson-Boltzmann equation numerically. Yes? Yes? Yes. And the field is given itself by the two 
Well, the, you see that the, there is a complete, the, I mean the, okay, I can show you. You see, we write, I write that uh, rho k of r for the species for the, is equal to e to the minus beta qk phi of r divided by zk, okay? But the real rho k of r, what should it be? So it's 1 over z, the real z, integral dr1, drk minus 1, drk plus 1, drm, uh, or dr, I don't know, okay, let, let me, e to the minus beta over 2, sum over i not equal to j of v of r, v coulomb of r i minus r j, right? So it's something like that. So it's much more complicated than, than this expression because it mixes all the particles. So it's a kind of, so then this is a mean field equation, a self-consistent mean field equation, which ignores completely all the correlation and the, and the, the correlations that exist between the particles. You see here, if I, I look at rho k and rho l, they are separated, they don't, uh, whereas here, they are not separated. For instance, in uh, Poisson-Boltzmann, the rho, the, the, the probability or, yeah, the probability to have r1, r k, is e to the minus beta sum over k of qk phi of rk divided by uh, z1, z2, right, by the product of the z. But in reality, it doesn't factorize, right? The probability is given by this Boltzmann factor divided by the total z. So this is the approximation. So when you formulate it like this, it sounds like it's uh, exact, but it's completely not exact. We will see in which limit it is correct uh, when we go to the field theoretic. Uh, is there any local answer for, for this number of cognitive? Local answer? What do you mean local? Yes. You mean local minima, yes. local solution. No, I tell you why, because what you can show is that, so it's a second order differential equation and uh, it has some, uh, okay, so there is some convexity property that can be formulated, which makes that if you satisfy the boundary conditions which are fixed, there is a unique solution. So if, if your initial guess satisfies the boundary condition and at each step of iteration you satisfy the boundary condition, if in the end it converges, you are sure that it has converged to the right solution. There is a unicity of the, so, okay. Okay. Okay, so now I will leave the equation here. So I will, now show one of the most used approximation. So before going to the actual analytic solution of the equation, I will go to the so-called de Bayhuke. Second, I just finished writing this. Yes? Sorry, can you repeat? Yes? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
So of course you have to satisfy. Look, you have to satisfy the boundary condition. And uh, hmm. okay, I'll think it over. <laughs> Sorry? Start. Sorry? There is a unique solution to this equation. Yes. No if, so that's the same question, right? Yes. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll look it up. I'll think about it. The initial guess. So the point is that if you s look at this equation, if you satisfy the boundary condition, then the solution is unique. But of course, if you solve from a completely wrong solution, even if it has the right uh, boundary condition, it will not converge. So you will... Uh, so you have to be close enough to the, or you have to be in the basin of attraction of the, okay. Okay. I will think about it and try to answer tomorrow. Okay, so uh, I, I would forget the row F because it's, uh, or I can keep it actually, it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, one of the interesting uh, approximation is what happens in a uh, weak, uh, weak what? Weak field or weak, weak charge. So weak charges means essentially that you are in a situation where beta qk phi is much smaller than one. So I can give you numbers. I have calculated it. So if you are at T equals 300K, uh, phi equals 25 millivolt, then beta E phi is equal to one. Okay, so this gives you a scale of, uh, so if, so QK, I remind you, is uh, beta ZK, so it's beta E phi times ZK. That's what you want. So if you have modal valence system, for instance, you want to have essentially potentials which are weak, smaller than 25 millivolts, which in biology is very, very frequent. It's a... Uh, typically less than 10 millivolts, so it's a fairly good approximation. So in that case, we can linearize to first, we can expand, yes? So, okay, when you said that, does the medium has any influence on that? It's, not in this. No, not in this. Here I am, well, in di indirectly, because here I assume that it is smaller than, uh, that, that this is sm much smaller than one. But of course, the value of phi is determined by this equation, which has, so we will see that, you, you will see, okay. Uh, so anyway, what I want to say is that uh, if I take this equation, if I am in this condition of weak charge, I can expand to first order in phi. And if I expand in first order in phi, so let me write it as minus, so I put the minus sign on the other side, minus Laplace and phi equals rho f over epsilon plus one over epsilon sum over k of, and then of, sorry, qk say ck zero times one so I expand this, so one minus beta QK phi. So the first term is sum over K of QK CK zero. Okay, and this quantity is equal to, to zero, right? If the system is neutral, if the system is globally neutral, then this quantity is just zero.
And therefore, the, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation takes the form of a Debye-Huckel equation, which I write, so this term, the one, this term disappears, and I can write it as minus Laplacian plus kappa d square phi equals rho f of r over epsilon, where kappa d square is beta over epsilon, right? Sum over k of ck zero qk square. So it's a linear equation and there is an external source if there is a fixed charges outside with minus Laplacian and kappa d square is this quantity. So kappa d square has the dimension of the inverse of a length <laughs> square and it is what I call the Debye length. So kappa d square because it, it's homogeneous to a Laplacian, so it goes like one over L square. So it's lambda D to the minus two. And so it's beta epsilon sum over K. So if you remember QK is the valence ZK times E. So it's, uh, sorry, not beta epsilon. So it's beta e square over epsilon sum over k of ck zero zk square. Yes, okay, I, I use uh, qk in terms of, and if you remember what was the Biorum length, the Biorum length is beta e square over 4 pi epsilon. So we have lambda d to the minus 2 equals 4 pi lb sum over k of ck0 zk square. And there is something which the chemists have introduced which is called so this is lambda d. So lambda d is the Debye length. I will show you how it enters in the system. Uh, chemists introduce what they call the ionic strength. which is a kind of measure of the total number of charges present in the system. So this ionic strength is just one half of sum over K of CK zero ZK square. And in which case lambda D to the minus two is eight pi LB times the ionic strength. So what's interesting is that the, <clears throat> so for instance, if you have a salt, if you have a salt, a ZZ salt, as we had before, for a ZZ salt, then uh, you can find that the lambda D uh, to the minus two is four pi LB and the two, so it's, the two concentrations are the same, C plus, C minus, and Z, 
there is plus z minus z. So essentially it's 8 pi Lb C Z square, where C is the concentration of the salt. So you see that lambda D for a salt scale like 1 over Z square root of C. So the Debye the length scales like the inverse of the square root of the concentration and like 1 over the valence of the ions. So we will see that this lambda D essentially is the screening length. It's the distance over which the electrostatic potential in the solution decreases exponentially. I will show this next. Uh, and to give some units, uh, if you put numbers, lambda D is essentially so 3.05 angstroms divided by z square root of c in molar. So that you just do the numerics and uh, so lambda d is 3.05 angstrom divided by z square root of the concentration of salt in molar. And I remind you that in physiological condition, typically the Debye length is about one nanometer. Yes? C is not a pure number. No, C is a concentration. So it's a number divided by a volume. So it's one over L cube. So C is 1 over L cube, and L is the distance, so it's 1 over L square. No, it's a number concentration, so it's a number divided by a volume. Okay. Okay, so now I have a choice. Either I let you go and uh, start practicing and uh, rehearsing for your exam, or I do. So the next thing, let me tell you what I, I will do next. Because uh, Matteo will not get too angry if I, okay. I, I just tell you what I want to do. So now I want to see what happens if I have one fixed charge in the system. So I have at that point the charge Q at, uh, let's say, at R equals zero at the origin. And I want to solve this equation. So I want to see what is the electrostatic potential. So I have my particle here. I have a salt all around. And I want to solve minus Laplacian plus kappa D square phi equals Q over epsilon delta of R. Okay? So what is the potential created by one charge screened, one charge in a bath in a, of a plus and minus ions? And so what I want to show, which I will show probably next time, is that phi of R is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon e to the minus kappa d r divided by r. And this is called the Debye Huckel potential. So this is, uh, and this is very interesting because this shows that, uh, so of course you see that if kappa d is zero, then this is just the Coulomb, the, the Poisson equation for pure Coulomb. If kappa d is zero, you just recover the standard Coulomb law. When there is screening, when there is this uh, ions in the solution, there is a, a non-zero kappa, and the electrostatic potential, instead of decaying algebraically like one over R, it decays much faster like an exponential e to the minus kappa d over R, and kappa d, I remind you, is 1 over lambda d, 
So that's the by length. So the Dubai length is, as we will see, it's essentially the length over which the potential, electrostatic potential is not too much affected and beyond which the electrostatic potential essentially can be neglected. Okay, so maybe I stop here, is that okay? Because, and so the next time we'll see how to derive this uh, property. Any question before you run away?